Uh, the first thing I need to say is it is a patient perspective. I'm not representative and I come from a group. I'll tell you a bit about me, but then I'll tell you about the group and a bit about our background so you understand that we're not representative, but we are a very interested and almost evangelical group of patients about tissue banking and the use of tissue and data in research. And it's quite interesting. I was sitting here thinking, I know quite a few of you already, and it's quite, that's quite good. But Alex and I chaired a meeting at the Wellcome Trust. That must be three years ago. When part of my job was to introduce Dr. Peekman, that he won't remember. <laughs> um, and part of that talk was actually complaining about the lack of lay involvement at the UK Biobank. Um, I've actually brought my <laughs> consent form with me. And it's quite interesting to look back all those years from when I joined the Biobank. And actually, uh, I think one of the problems is actually if you engage more with the public, you get much more of the public on board and understanding the value of what you're doing. And I think it's rather sad if patients aren't involved in that sort of way. So that's my rant. So my <coughs> background, um, I was a health visitor, so I'm very interested in the public health aspects of this. Um, and th that's why I mentioned about the children's immunising, because when we were going back years when we were going seeing new babies we automatically signed people up for immunizing I had breast cancer was on the clinical study group there is the breast intergroup which we went to yesterday and we I've been involved with the campaign tissue bank right from the beginning at the planning stage really good involvement in tissue banking I'm also um, on the exec for the cancer biobanks and I notice Anne's here and it's great news that she's gone on from the biobanks to set up the uh, tissue directory and coordinating centre, which I heard yesterday, we've got a link. And I'm involved with the Christie uh, ECMC and um, that goes back years because I come from Liverpool originally and I had my first surgery in Manchester. And we belong to the uh, stakeholder group for the HTA and ICPV started about six years ago. <coughs> so we're a patient advocate group. We're independent of everybody. So we're not skewed by any, um, anybody else's aims or objectives or politics or politicians or professional jealousies. Uh, we have members who are involved in many areas of cancer research. We have a summer school every other year at Brighton when Leslie Fallowfield actually hosts us and pays for us to go to, this, uh, to Brighton for two days. Um, and that's brilliant. But we also run study days up and down the country. And the first one was held at Leeds, which is where Val started off and Val has continued to support us over the years. Um, and having done it at Leeds, we realise that that's the best um, model because we go around academic centres, so they host us for free and they teach us for free, but it also means that we spread the word around the country and we involve different people. We now moved on and we do a five-day residential science course for advocates at BART's each year. We've done it two years and there's another one coming up in September. This is based on the American project lead training that some of us have done in breast cancer. But we shouldn't have to go to the States for this sort of training. We should have it here. We've got much better scientists and much better researchers and much more understanding of patient involvement. Um, and so we, we do this course and we're looking to do it in other parts of the UK. We had a recent symposium on multiple biopsies with a multidisciplinary group at Institute in Fulham Road. And this was after we got asked to comment on a new trial which involved in multiple biopsies and how, how acceptable that would be to patients. And so we said we didn't want just the researchers or the people using the tissue, we wanted the people who actually asked the patients to join in. And that is sometimes the big barrier, it's the surgeon or the nurse who is overprotective. And if you don't ask patients, you're denying them choice. And it was, it was, we had about 60 people there in the end and it was really, really good mix. And you could see some of the professionals actually physically relax as they realised they could actually talk with us informally and, and it wasn't going to be a problem. So this is our Science for Advocates. Um, we think it's the only one in the world, actually, that actually has hands-on 
uh, lab content. So these are patients actually in the lab. So we start off by learning how to use the pipette and we go on to doing our own DNA. Then we have some tonsil tissue and some breast tissue and we actually do our own slides all the way through. And the final day we see a breast straight from theatre which, and see the way it is received in the, in the department and how it's cared for, how it's uh, prepared and how it's sliced and how these bits are taken for both bunking as well as for diagnostics. And it's brilliant. And the, everybody who goes on this course is warned what they're going into and they know that uh, you know, they're going to see things. But nobody's opted out and it's voted each time it's been voted the, the highlight of the whole uh, course. It also means we meet pathologists. You know, we don't meet pathologists normally. And actually, you're crucial. If you don't get it right, the, the others can't get it right. So we need to meet more pathologists and work with you. We had a dragon's den, and we, we, other people have pinched this since, but we, we did it at Westminster. And we invited people to come and talk about trials that needed patient involvement that might be difficult to recruit to. And um, they, they gave a presentation, then we had open discussion, question and answers, and then we gave them written feedback, and one of our members then joined a trial working group. It's been adapted since then for different um, areas, and um, there were trials that actually altered their protocol as a result of attending a, a Dragon's Den. And the feedback from both lay and professionals that it was a valued event, and it really was uh, worth doing, we were quite surprised how many of the professionals were actually really anxious about coming and speaking to us. And I think this is one of the things we've got to get over. We've got to get the relaxation between the patients who are involved in this way and the professionals. So we collaborate with all sorts of people. We're independent of the lot, but we work with everybody if we can. So we're in all sorts of... Uh, groups and meet, we go to meetings and we go to organisational things. We have been involved with the HRA from before it was reorganised and we were part of the patient involvement working group there. Um, we work with people like the Wellcome Trust over the data and through Beth Thompson I actually went to the meeting in Brussels about data collection recently and she's just circulated another um, article that she wants people to sign up to so I can circulate that if you haven't had it already. Um, and we work with very much with other cancer charities um, like Cancer 52, the Rare Cancer Foundation, Can Unknown Primary and the Brains Trust which is a brilliant charity um, and Will can tell you all about the Brains Trust. But we are also involved with the ECPC, which is the European Patient Coalition, which is very different from the UK. And the patients in Europe are not actually involved in research on the whole. They're interested in raising money for research and they're interested in raising uh, standards and campaigning for better treatments. But it's not the same as the hands-on involvement in the research. The MBCC is the organisation in the States that actually paid for some of us to go and do the training there. And through that, you, get, you can go to the uh, San Antonio Conference, uh, which is then funded by the Alamo Advocates. But we want a session there for the advocates. About 200 go to this conference. We want a session with British scientists giving a British interpretation because they talk about the European bit, but they haven't a clue what the European bit is. And they don't seem to realise that Europe is very different from the UK. And we have been involved in some ASCO guidelines. Some of the trials that we've been involved in, this isn't up to date, there's a lot more since this. So, the donation of tissue. We, we feel that the public does understand the need for research to improve outcomes. We're specifically cancer, by the way, not generic research, but obviously they interact. And the public willingly donates to funding, and the public is funding most of what everybody does in terms of tissue banking and research. But the public understanding of the need for human tissue, we think, is minimal, and that needs to improve. And it should be make um, tissue donation as normal as blood donation. So patients as donors, 
We think they're anxious, they're dealing with a new experience anyway. They listen, but they don't always hear. Many will have received lots of well-meaning but erroneous in information and will have been on the internet without a guide to what's credible and what's not credible. They need honesty, they need somebody who listens as well as talks and deals with the person as well as the tumour. But most of us are tougher than you think and you can ask us about going in trials, you can ask us about giving tissue. We were people before we were patients. And we, in our group, we've got an amazing array of previous backgrounds. Our chair is an immunologist. We have different life and work experiences before we got the cancer, including our age, culture, family support, financial needs, and we often do want to research, participate in research. Communication is vital, and it's got to be two-way between all these people and with across the group as well, but I couldn't get the arrows to do that. <laughs> I'm IT illiterate. <laughs> if you don't get communication, you don't get uh, willing input from the public. The public doesn't understand what you're doing and there isn't the enthusiasm there should be. And the people that don't want to take part in pharma trials, or um, I think it was you were talking about that, they've got to understand that they're alive because of pharma. And there is that we've got to, we're not um, going to give carte blanche to anything, but we have to work together. And I think that's communicating. And you recognize a well known researcher there who's actually looked after us right from the word go when we very first started. And this is informal collaboration, communicating, and it works. Marid's over there, and Val's over there. So we work with researchers and it's really important and particularly in the metastatic tissue donation and I want to know from the UK Biobank if you're collecting tissue, if somebody when they sign up has got a tumour and then later have secondary disease, do you collect the metastatic tissue? And also do you, have you gone on to look at perhaps collecting post-mortem tissue where the metastatic tissue isn't collectible? beforehand. But that would be a good link with, say, the campaign tissue bank in Brest. Charlie Swanton's team at UCL, we've been working with for quite a long time now on his Tracer X lung trial, but also there's going to be a Tracer X breast. And the piece is a post-mortem tissue collection. And they, the, the scientist, Charlie and his assistant, both say that they, we gave them the confidence and the courage to go and ask the patients, and it's been remarkably successful. I've already talked about the multiple biopsy. We also worked with Bridget Wilkins at Guy's and St. Thomas's with their trainees about collaborating. And we did a survey of um, uh, public and professional and informed patients about their attitudes towards donation and use of tissue. And that was to uh, help us produce a public guide to tissue donation. But we haven't actually got on with that because we haven't had time but that's something, it's a pipe dream still, that we could actually produce a really useful public guide to tissue donation. Aidan Hindley from the Gift Bank, Bank at Leeds has been really good in actually helping where we've had people who've wanted to donate tissue afterwards. And I used my, uh, I was being told, I was on the um, Marmot report and then on the uh, information for, the new information for breast screening leaflet. And I was told it, we couldn't have research mentioned on that leaflet because it would frighten people. And I was seeing it as an informed patient, experienced patient, not as a member of the public. So I went and uh, did a, a straw poll of my aqua class at David Lloyd, which is 14 women of screening age. And lo and behold, they did read the leaflet. We were told they didn't read the leaflet either, but they do. They might not remember what was in it, but they do. Research would make them more confident because as they're doing research, they're up to date. Tissue wasn't a problem as long as they knew what it was for and why it was being collected. And post-mortem also, well, why not? 
And one lady who's there, who's 83, who's been diabetic since her 20s, whose daughter's diabetic, insulin diabetic, and she came and said, do you think they'd want my body for diabetic research? And I said, I haven't a clue, but we'll find out. She's now signed up with Aidan. She's not on internet, so it's been all, on, done on the phone. He's talked to her, and he's talked to her all the way through. He's talked to her daughter. The daughter knows that when Joy dies, she gets in touch, the daughter gets in touch with uh, Aidan, and the uh, body gets taken up to Leeds. They take what they need and then the body is returned to the undertaker and they're absolutely thrilled. They know this is going to happen and she's giving her contribution. We also talk quite a lot with um, Brain Trust, uh, the Alzheimer's Disease uh, Society and the MND people because they've been doing post-mortem tissue collection for, for a long time and they're much more skilled and they know how to do it. When I worked in um, palliative care, um, the first thing a patient who with MND would tell us usually was when I die my brain's got to go to King's and it was really important to them that we knew and that we had it organised that that happened. And sometimes we, we need to, uh, as well as raising enthusiasm from patients and the public, we actually also need to make sure that's realistic and we don't raise un unrealistic expectations. And we have actually uh, now become members of some of the GCIPs, although we haven't been had our um, interest recognised by the main Genomics England. So we feel there's an important role for patient and public involvement in training for professionals so they feel more comfortable when approaching potential donors and in fact one of our members is involved in the lay recruitment of donors at Nottingham where the, uh, the lay people actually do the recruiting and the consenting. Recruitment's gone up and the um, cost has gone down. The, they are trained, they're selected and they're on honorary contracts and it works. And raising public awareness of the need for tissue donation means that uh, it should become as normal as blood donating. Breast Cancer Campaign Tissue Bank, two of us have been involved right from the beginning. So we've um, done the site visits, the interviews, um, the management and the tissue access. And um, there's still two people on the management board and three on the tissue access committee. So tissue is not released without lay approval as well as science approval. Uh, that's changing because, um, and the logo will change because of the uh, new merge between campaign and uh, breakthrough. But at the moment, this is the... And there's been a genuine desire for meaningful involvement. It's not just tick the box. W they, there is a real interest in what the patient thinks. And this is from uh, most professionals outside, but the staff of, of um, Breast Cancer Campaign have been crucial in this. We've got a good working relationship. We feel valued and we feel that we're being heard. But we also feel we're learning together. And there's a willingness and enthusiasm. So how did we influence? It's the elephant in the room question. But we started off by suggesting, instead of the, the banks were, you know, selecting one bank, that they actually worked together. And that made the much larger tissue bank. Um, we asked the elephant in the room question, we're, we're only patients, so it's never a stupid question. We can say what we like, question what we like. And it's often what the professionals wanted to ask, but felt, you know, that wasn't quite right. We've made changes to the tissue access policy and the patient ven benefit must be clear. It has to be an understandable lay summary, and it goes back if it's not. And actually, very interesting, at one of the campaign events, there was a researcher there whose, whose application we'd sent back because it wasn't understandable, the, the lay summary we didn't, couldn't understand. And he actually came and thanked us because he said rewriting it made it much more understandable to him in order to actually describe it to other people. And there's a discussion on, on the application for tissue before um, it, it, the decision is taken. On the tables, I've left some of our review books and also the patient information sheet. It's a, a patient to patient information sheet, so, and it's been vetted by CIUK. Um, and we understand that because it's patient to patient information, it doesn't have to go through ethics, but it usually has to go through R&D 
in the different places, which I understand is more of a problem. Um, it's been adapted for use by Campaign Tissue Bank, specifically in use for the, the breast tissue bank. And it has been used, I think it's the haematology group who are also adapting it. It's downloadable from our website with a template on the back where you can add your own contact information. And Myra, who's sitting over there, manages our website, so is the person to ask about that. This is the leaflet, the back of the leaflet, um, and th there are some on the tables. And the chair of the group, Alistair Thompson, this is his view of our input. He says, we're the most supportive of all groups for the bank, despite having no personal vested interest. Kept them grounded in reality. We're very helpful with ethics and information sheet issues. Made us all realize that standard practice is a terrible waste of resources that tissues were being thrown away because patients weren't being asked. That would be a real pleasure to work with and we made good comments and responded to emails better than the professionals. The following slides are a collection of quotes which I've collected over the past five years but I think are very relevant today. And they all refer to the need to remember that tissue comes from real people. It's not a commodity and it's been donated to assist in the development of earlier diagnosis and more effective treatments for patients. Earl Howe, life sciences are a vital part of the UK economy. There's ambition for Britain to become a leader in the global hub for life sciences, science. But he also said that wide patient participation is needed because the more patients are involved, the more benefit is produced. Confederation of Cancer Biobanks, the guidelines say, biosample resources should protect public trust. The loss jeopardizes research banking and the potential benefits that it may bring. Individual organizations should operate in a culture of communication, transparency, fairness, and accountability to all stakeholders, but particularly to the donors and the patients to maintain that trust. Time magazine, biobanking is one of the top 10 things likely to change the world, but we need to get it right, ensuring quality throughout the collection, processing, storage, and use. Children's cancer and leukemia, there's a leaflet on biological studies and biobanking. And this one of the questions in it says, who owns the samples? And the answer given is that the CCLG is the custodian of the samples, but you retain all of your rights over the sample. Is that reflected in UK Biobank? Is that reflected in Genomics England? You need to get the messages right and, and consistent. Nuffield Council on Bioethics. Good governance systems are an essential requirement if potential donors are to have the trust necessary for them to consider donation in the first place. People donating should be treated as partners in the research and their ongoing interest in the progress of the research should be recognized. Make them shareholders in the banks. You know, give them some responsibility as well as you know, rights. The two things go together. I can't pronounce this name, but she's from the PhD Foundation. Implementing medical paradigm shifts is never straightforward and requires a concerted effort from a range of stakeholders, such as scientists, doctors, policymakers, and patient groups. Factors needing consideration to prevent barriers include ethical and legal issues, education, awareness, and acceptance among health professionals and the general public. So our mantra is that we believe clinical research and practice, including biobanking, is improved by patients being partners with clinicians and healthcare professionals rather than pas um, passive recipients of healthcare. Our wish list, we want to continue adding constructive PPI for research and some biobanks, including GEL and UK Biobank. We want to expedite the production of our public guide and we welcome some help with that if anybody's interested. We'd like to co-host a public meeting on the donation and use of tissue, including metastatic and post-mortem. And we want to continue working on consent issues with help from Victoria Chico at the Sheffield School of Law, who's been available to us for the last few years. And we want more time and more members. So if you know any maverick patients who aren't interested in support groups, but are actually really interested in the research 
and getting to know more and to be educated into doing, adding an effective voice at the table, then get in touch with us. Also on the table are some leaflets that give our criteria for membership. And the other problem we have is funding. Because we're not providing support, it, as a cancer charity, it's very difficult to raise funding. And we don't get any from the usual sources. So if anybody's got any bright ideas or knows any <coughs> phil philanthropists that might be interested, we'd like to know. Thank you.